CataractCoach.com. Welcome to episode 10 of our podcast series. Today we have Dr. Fasica Huereta. She's the director of the ophthalmology residency program at the Wilmer Institute of Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, Maryland, here in the USA. She's also an expert in ocular trauma, and she's done specific training in that regard and set up a beautiful ocular trauma center to really bring the highest level of care to these very complicated patients. We also talk in detail about ophthalmology residency and what's the future of it, what's the best way to learn, what are the challenges that are facing the young doctors in training today. It's about an hour long, there's some really great material, I think you'll really enjoy it, and even I picked up some great pearls about how to best deal with certain ocular traumas, and those are the things we're all going to see. I hope you enjoy it, check it out. So I want to welcome you guys to our Cataract Coach podcast, and today we have Fasico Oreda. She is the head of the residency program at the Wilmer Institute at Johns Hopkins, professor there as well, big interest in not only cornea and cataract surgery, of course, but ocular trauma, including a fellowship, which is very unusual, at Moorfields in not only trauma, but also cataract trauma. So this is obviously, if you're a cataract coach fan, you know this is a great topic, and we love all this stuff. So welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time out to talk to us. Thank you so much for having me today. Great to be here. Yeah, so the neat thing about you is I did, I did my homework, I did my due diligence, so it looks like you grew up very close to where you practice now. Yes, so, I am a Maryland native, and I went to undergrad at University of Maryland and stayed at medical school for Hopkins, Wilmer for residency, and I just left to do a fellowship at Baskin Palmer in Moorfields, and then I, I went back to Hopkins, where yeah, I've been ever and, since. And you did an MPH, too, so I like oh, that yes. as well. I like yes. that as well. So one of the things I really want to talk to you about is, you know, I was involved with resident teaching as well for a very long time. I did from the year 2000 to 2022, or 22 years worth with the residents at UCLA, and I had a fantastic time. But residency programs are changing a lot. And what are some of the changes that are happening now? I know some people may not realize, like me, that residencies are now just no more two matches. You don't have to do an internal medicine or rotational match for an internship plus an ophthalmology match. It's all together. Is that nationwide, and do you think that's a benefit to the programs? Yeah, so for ophthalmology, it is um, nationwide. So every program starting, um, a, 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 you know, several years ago, and, and this was the final year where you would get a citation if you weren't um, integrated or joint, has integrated their um, internship. So I, they can either be integrated where it's all under the SF match and, you know, ophthalmology is the residency program director. So that's our situation at Hopkins, or it could be joint where medicine is, or surgery or whatever um, specialty you're associated with is the program director. But, you, you know, you just match at one institution for four years. So I think the main benefit of it is to get the interns exposure to ophthalmology for three months, as well as they get used to the institution while they'll be at for the next three years. So they'll be integrated with the um, the consult services, as well as um, the EMR that um, is used at the hospital. So it's definitely, we've seen great benefits. This is our second year. Um, we're finishing our second year of integrated interns at, at Hopkins. Yeah, so it's kind of nice you get to not only hit the ground running, so when you're PGY2 and you're starting that full, first full year of ophthalmology, you've already been exposed to it. So you said about three months in the internship year would be ophthalmology, nine, yes. nine months of, of, let's say, rotating or medicine or surgery or something else. So the total exactly. now becomes three years and three months from just, of just ophthalmology, so 39 months. Is that enough? And the reason I ask this now is I'm always surprised at how much our field advances. Like, I hate to admit it, when I finished residency in the year 2000, there was no OCT machine, there was no lamellar corneal transplantation, there was no anti-VEGF injections. It was just a different world. So our residents not only learn everything I learned, but like everything else that happened in the last 20 years in the same amount of time. Do you think it's enough time? Uh, I actually do think it's enough time. Now, I think the integrated internship is really beneficial in giving that three months of extra ophthalmology to help with that transition to PGY2 year, because I think that's the hardest year for residents across the country. So they're doing a lot of emergency care. Their learning curve is so steep. It's nothing like what they learned in med school. And so I think that extra three months in intern year really helps them to get ready to take independent call. I remember when I was a resident, we had two weeks of buddy call, and then it was you in the ED. <laughs> so that was a terrifying experience. So I think this three months plus, you know, now we have three months of buddy call, even as a PGY um, two. So I think, you know, the, the transition is, is definitely better than what it was when some of us trained. Um, and I do think it's enough. Now, one interesting trend we're seeing in graduate medical education is a lot of talk about competency-based 
um, evaluation of milestones. So as we know, it's really not the numbers that necessarily matter and um, everyone re reaches competency at a different number. So for example, plastic surgery, they're um, piloting a competency-based time variable training, which I love that idea because um, it, like you said, it is enough for most residents, but there may be some who do need a little bit of extra time and judging on competency versus numbers and a set number of years, I think um, moving towards a competency-based time variable training, I think is something that will be invested will be investigated in the future. So what would be those milestones then for checking for competency, just for example? Because, you know, most of our audience is not involved in U.S. academic ophthalmology, so it's kind of a new concept to them. I know I was with residents always having to do those, the milestone things and the evaluations, but what yes. are some, what are some of the milestones? So the AC Jimmy has these milestones that we've been using for approximately seven years now. Like when I was a resident, we didn't have the milestones. So we judge them on medical knowledge, professionalism, sure. the seven core competencies and surgical um, surgical um, training is under that. So um, as we evaluate them each year based on their milestones, making sure there's um, adequate progression. Like Again, some people will reach it earlier than others. So you, you might think that, you know, for some people, four years is enough. But again, for some people, they may, may, they may need an extra year. So um, I think the milestones help us evaluate and compare um, residents in the same class. So it's actually been quite helpful. And actually, they have new milestones for faculty educators, too, which um, I think will be helpful for evaluation of surgical teachers. Oh, yes. You got to teach the teachers, right? Absolutely. You got to make sure the teachers are basically on the same page with the curriculum. Yeah, which, in fact, what you were saying, and if I think back at the 22 years that I was with UCLA, um, yeah, there were some residents who needed an extra six months of residency. And there was one resident who needed an extra year. But again, the goal was, of course, to make that level of competency. Absolutely. And as, as we know, too, some residents are, the surgery comes a little bit more naturally to some residents than others. So um, the other thing is you don't know that when you apply in ophthalmology. So I would also think um, one, one thing which is a little bit controversial is thinking about, like, when, let's say an, a, a resident's a great resident, except they're not a good surgeon. So they're, you know, considering alternate paths, like, for example, medical retina or neuro-ophthalmology, where we won't graduate them as surgeons, but in medical subspecialties is something that I think we should consider because there are, you know, we do see some surgeons, who, uh, some some residents who um, are not, um, you know, maybe will, ne will not be competent at upon graduation and they still maybe should be ophthalmologists but um, I think differentiating surgical versus medical ophthalmology is something potentially to consider in the future. You know it's interesting you mentioned that I, I actually agree with you that you got to find what makes you happy. I had a, my one of my most watched videos so far this year on Cataract Coach was a video where I just read an email that I received from an anonymous resident who said I'm considering giving up operating it's just not for me it's so stressful I don't enjoy it and I just sought advice from all our cataract coach viewers. And we had, gosh, hundreds and hundreds of, of, of points of input. But I think what you're saying is actually quite true, is that not everyone has this. Which, big, which brings me to my next question, though. Should we be checking for some of this? Stereopsis, I know some programs do that already. What about hand-eye coordination? If you remember back in the old days, ENT residencies used to make uh, med students do soap carvings. Mm -hmm. So should, yeah, should, should we be checking? Like, let's say you have a surgical simulator. Should you put every med student who comes to interview on, like, the quick 10-minute surgical simulator just to see what they're capable of? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question today. And it's definitely tricky because, you know, we don't really want to be... For example, like the question of like disability and whether you know that would be discriminatory in any way is something that we have to think about. And also, the other thing is it's hard to tell as a med student, you know, to predict their uh, their final sort of outcome sure. as a surgeon. But um, I do feel that now, like there was a revolution in medical retina, right? So you you know injections injections are the primary treatment for diabetic retinopathy and AMD, and even neuro ophthalmology. Like many neuro neurologists are now doing neuro ophthalmology. So I feel like the medical aspect has especially in medical retina has been developed more so when they get to residency if you know they decide surgery is not for them I think they should have a, a path to still be a board certified ophthalmologist but in, in medical but again that that's controversial I think yeah I mean I guess I could see both sides of it but I, I happen to agree with you you got to find what your happiness is like for me going to the operating room is my happy place I've said before that sometimes I'll be on vacation like I was recently in Malaysia at the APO meeting with you and I, I went for two weeks to enjoy and when I was there I just thought like, oh, today's my normal surgery day. I kind of miss doing surgery. And yeah. people would think like, what are you, crazy? You're here to enjoy a beautiful trip and this beautiful country and you're thinking about working? 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. But you're right, though. It would be really interesting to look at, you know, are there predictors as medical students to see what what their final predictors are as uh, as residents? But, you know, we just don't have that data yet. But I, I think it would be interesting. But, you know, I think if we could do it in a way that um, would not sort of, uh, it would be uh, generous, so we wouldn't be excluding people who may develop into good surgeons, which we see all the time as well. Like you know, lots of residents start off, you know, and then but by the end of their residency, they, they really blossom and are excellent surgeons. Yeah, the other thing too is there are, probably, there are other aspects that we can do to practice and get better surgery. Now we have surgical simulators. You've got the wet lab. You've got my old fashioned. I'm kind of an old guy. I'd, I'd always tell residents, if you really want to be great in the, in the in operating room, you got to go to the wet lab and do at least 500 sutures of tenon nylon. And I used to call That's it awesome. the DevGAN 10, 10, 10. Can you do 10 sutures of tenon nylon in 10 minutes? That's amazing. In, in the lab. If you can do that, then I am sure you, you can know how to work with your hands on another scope. And more importantly, it teaches you the drive, the hard work. So do you have any other pearls like this? So obviously you guys have a wet lab and simulators and all the above. Yes, we were lucky that, um, so the two, one of the chiefs who was two years before I was chief, uh, uh, Dr. Shamima Sigder, um, made it her goal to develop our wet labs. So she had philanthropy, raised uh, money for, and they opened, um, it's, we call it Offset, um, Center for Microsurgical Training. So um, it's really, ha it's, she really spent a lot of time and resources developing the space. And also, so, and we do have the IC simulator. And the other thing, we spent a lot of time on the cu surgical curriculum starting for PGY2 residents. And now, you know, eventually we hope to do it for PGY1 residents. But actually this week I, I got two emails from other PGY2 um, throughout the country asking about, you know, how to de de develop that space and what the t resources and, and, and so, so forth that went into it. So I think a lot of programs are really expanding the wet lab and realizing the importance of, uh, uh, of that. And yes, the IC is wonderful. And, you know, we know it reduces um, surgical complications. So as you said, spending as much time in the wet lab um, with the simulator. We also have the Kataro model eyes, uh, yeah, animal eyes, sure. pig eyes, you know, wh whatever, whatever you could do. So like you said, most, most people can learn the surgery with, with that practice. And it does, I, I love your 500 sutures and actually our residents start as, as PGY2 um, um, uh, or PGY3 residents. They are primary surgeons for open globe surgeries. Um, oh, so nice. like you said, suturing is, is the basic. So and you said you can even now residents even have practice um, microscope at home where they can practice suture oh, wow. at home. Um, so some, wow. yeah, yeah. And then using their left hand, left and right hands um, and just becoming ambidextrous, I think is important. So, you know, fortunately most people can learn it, but you know, there's, there's a, you know, there's a few who don't like it or, you know, are, are challenged by it. And so. Yeah. I, in fact, that the non, um, non-dominant hand development is so important. When I was with teaching residents, I'd always tell them, listen, mm -hmm. you better eat, brush your teeth, mm -hmm. shave, whatever with your non-dominant hand. Yeah, and and right. then then the, the the catch was that like when we go when I take him out to the sushi dinner I better see those chopsticks you're nodding out your head let's see what you can do <laughs> exactly I remember <laughs> doing, doing that when I was a resident too so but no I think I, mean, I think it makes a big difference you really got to you have to put a concerted effort into trying to, to really develop that and I think yeah the, the residents to me who have stood out in the past have really just been super driven it's not necessarily whatever natural talent you're born with. And kind of the analogy I give is like a basketball free throw. If you told me you'd give me a million dollars if I could sink 15 basketball free throws in a row, do you know how crazy I am? You know how hard I practice? Yeah. All day, every day, no matter what? So just, and I don't have the natural skill of someone else who's obviously much better than me at basketball, but I do it. So same with the suturing or same with any other aspect of it. I think if they put the effort in. I had a resident once where I went very early to the county hospital. I was got there before 6 a.m. I had to do a conference call with the East Coast. I just thought I'd go. And he's already in the back room of the clinic where we have like an old 20-year-old microscope. And he's suturing a tomato. Yeah. He's, he's a cherry tomato there, and he's just, he just cut it. And he's sitting there doing Teto nylons. Yeah, exactly. I think, like you said, practicing at home on tomatoes or, you know, grapes. or And then also even the capsule rexis, there's some, uh, you know, like there's some models where you can practice it on at home, I think. I think both at practicing at home in the wet lab, using simulators as much as you can during your training um, is essential. And, you know, you see, you know, once you get better surgically to the numbers, the, the, those, the residents who are better surgeons do get higher numbers just because um, it's sort of like a self-fulfilling prophecy. They build their confidence. And, and so I think it's really important to, to dedicate, an, uh, dedicate time to that during, during residency. So one of the things we're talking about is that 
Yeah, if the resident has picked up a little bit more agility or skill in the operating room, then that resident, he or she will be able to do more cases in a kind of a given amount of block time, and you may see disparities in total surgical volume. Yeah, you... absolutely. We've de I've definitely noticed that in our training. So at last year, actually, I had my resident um, uh, graduate with the highest uh, reach of record at Wilmer, and he... Um, I think it was uh, 320 cataracts, and and we don't have a VA, so and um, he definitely really went out, really practiced every kind of surgery. I think he had the numbers, the highest numbers across every kind of surgery, including secondary IOLs, corneal transplants, and so forth. And you know, again, lots, lots, and lots of practice. So I do feel, you know, like I said, it's a self-fulfilling pro prophecy because you know your patients get good results, and you build your confidence, and then also um, in systems where um, attendings will pass. Obviously, the attendings will pass if they feel more comfortable with with the surgeon. So, um, yeah. So it's really important to to do that practice. Are, are there pearls you have for the residents who are struggling a little bit or learning surgery? Because a lot of when I was in Malaysia, I was uh, very impressed that literally hundreds of young doctors came up to me and said, you know, in our country, and they came from various countries, there's not as much of a formalized residency training. So they're almost kind of self-taught, and they're doing these residencies that are kind of more like apprenticeships. What are the pearls you have for the young doctors who are learning surgery and struggling a little bit? Yeah, that's the beauty, the, the beauty of training in the U.S. is you know you will get hands-on training, so there will be no apprenticeship. So I would say, um, as you said, practice, 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 number one. And then also watching videos, like your cataract coach. I, I think there's been an explosion of um, resources online. And then also, there's also been an explosion of courses offered to residents. Like in my day, we used to all go to the Mass Signer course, so there's that still, as well as tons of other courses that they can go to. So I um, And now the AUPO has the Standardized Surgical Curriculum Score, which is offered twice a year for residents to learn um, FACO, MIGS, the Yamani. So I think making the most of all the um, wet labs offered nationally as well as your institution is also critical. I think that's great advice. Another one that I had was that don't get so hung up on the actual number of cases you're doing, but really concentrate on what are you getting out of each case? What are you learning from each case? And in particular, I told you to tell residents, at the end of every case, write down a couple things you did great, a couple things you wish you did better, and a couple things you're going to work on afterwards or look up or some knowledge you don't really know, some technique. And then the other one was recording video. I think now basically all our operating rooms have the ability to have some sort of video being recorded. And residents who fail to record their videos of their cases, you're doing yourself a huge disservice because you can't go back and watch that case. You'll never learn from game day footage. Absolutely. I think that's a critical uh, video review is, is absolutely critical. And, you know, most of our tanks will review it with the um, resident at the end of the case as well. Um, and then, as you said, the resident, I remember actually when I was a resident going to telling it like it is with um, Bobby Osher, and he was like, you have to record, otherwise you never know when a complication is going to happen. And then you can sort of analyze what happened and learn from it. So um, in addition to uh, recording all their cases from, from the beginning of residency, I think the re review with experience attending. So we, I mentioned Dr. Sigter, who's the head of our um, wet lab. She also spends time video reviewing with the residents in addition to the, um, the actual attending staffing the cases reviewing it. So I think um, I, I totally agree with you. Their you know, video review is, is absolutely critical. Yeah, I think it's a, a great asset. And yeah, as you said, there's so many great online resources now that you can learn from to really advance those skills. Let's shift gears just a little bit and talk about trauma, ocular trauma. So tell us about your center. You have a beautiful center there, especially for ocular trauma. Tell us about that place. Yeah, so we are a designated, uh, at Wilmer, we're a designated eye trauma center, which means we're designated by um, MIMS, which, um, the state of Maryland. So so we get a lot of referrals from the surrounding region. So what does that mean to be a designated eye trauma center? We basically have sp uh, specific specifications like a, we have to have a designated ophthalmologist in-house 24-7. We have to have the ability to see trauma patients within an hour. We have to have 24-hour capability to go to the OR. So, um, so it's... It's great to be a trauma center and um, um, the residents, I think it's the highlight of our program in terms of by the end of that PGY2 year and as PGY3, they do a lot of the open globes, um, complex lid lacerations, orbital fractures. So the, the trauma experience is, is, is extraordinary. Um, and I think, as I mentioned, PGY3s begin doing open globe surgeries um, staffed by an assistant chief of service. So that at Wilmer is a fellowship trained um, 
attending who is dedicated to resident teaching who is, comes back and spends a year dedicated to teaching the residents trauma. So I was I, I, I was in that role in 2014 and that's really what um, started my love for trauma. And um, in addition to being the assistant chief of service, we call the art chief, the um, assistant director of the eye trauma center. Um, and then now I, I moved into the role of the director of that, but I think the chief role helped me um, a, a year of doing globes with the residents um, and constant trauma was was really um, an amazing experience um, in terms of um, my uh, making me love the working with residents as well as um, starting my love for trauma. Um, about how many open globe injuries do you think you t take care of per year? So at Wilmer BC, it, you know, it varies from year to year, but anywhere from about 150 to 200 cases. Um, and wow, and we used, busy. yeah, it's busy. Yeah, we used to have. Um, our own, and, and our own IED, um, which was separate from the main ER. So we had a lot of volume and a lot of people would come in with non-urgent sort of itchy burnings in the middle of the night. But now um, that um, our, main, our main ER closed in, um, our Wilmer ED closed in 2011 and we integrated into the main ER. So overall, the, the, the volume of patients we see is less, but the acuity is, is pretty high because they, they go to the main ER and, and we have, a again, in-house ophthalmology resident on call. Um, and um, you know the attendings, uh, the chief is uh, takes call pretty much um, all year, in addition to subspecialty faculty. Well, yeah, I think that's uh, I can understand for the residents they don't want to see an itchy, burny eye at two in the morning. But yeah. a, but a ruptured globe, they'll happily go to the OR to take care of. Yeah, absolutely. With such a huge volume of ruptured globe cases, which is quite large, like at our county hospital where I was teaching residents, we'd get more like fifty in a year. 50 ruptured globe cases. What, is, what are some of your just basic pros? Remember, our audience skew is pretty young here. What are your, some of your basic pros for patients presenting with an open globe injury? Let's see, corneal scleral laceration from sharp trauma. What, what are your kind of basic pearls here? Yeah, I think being systematic in the evaluation um, is important so that you can be thorough. But I think number one, um, you know, as thinking about the prognosis, so looking for the APD, the, the classifying the zone of the injury, not missing an intraocular foreign body. So all of our patients get a CT, mm, a dry yeah. CT scan um, on presentation. We do give IV antibiotics, um, a one dose in the ED before they go to the OR. Um, like a fluoroquinolone or something? A fluoroquinolone in adults, and then in and. Um, and then we, I think the shield is important. A lot of times that's forgotten. So making sure to shield the eye. Um, and then we usually do that. We don't, at Wilmer, we don't do the open globes in the middle of the night, um, unless it's an intraocular foreign body. Um, so, but we'll do it usually first thing um, the next morning. Um, and so there's some debate about, you know, do, do, basically the literature shows that if you do it within 24 hours, um, you're okay. Uh, but there's some debate whether there's um, any difference in visual outcome, wh whether you've repaired again in the middle of the night versus first thing in the morning. Our our approach is that, you know, the OR team, even the surgeon, like we think the best, you know, you'll be at your best kind of first thing in the morning. But again, if it's an intraocular form body, they, we will, they will take it at 2 a.m. Obviously, other emergencies like a, um, a trapdoor fracture in a kid will also come in and do that at 2 a.m. But otherwise, it's um, sort of first, we, we, we have OR time that's dedicated for trauma, so it'll be sort of as, as early in the morning as we can get the patient there. Yeah, one of, one of my great pros that I learned was, you know, when you're there to close that globe, then your primary goal is to close the globe. You, you can always come back and do another surgery in a few days, a few weeks, whatever it takes. But, you know, obviously, just get the globe closed. Yeah, that's a great point because, you know, as we know, you can have a lot of associated injuries like traumatic cataract, um, you know, vitreous hemorrhage, but I totally agree. Closing the globe is the primary objective. And, you know, as a, as a cataract surgeon, usually like if there is violation of the lens capsule, I'll just try to aspirate any free sure. lens material. But as you said, you're not really, um, you know, trying to fake a, a fresh wound in an eye with a fresh wound. So even going back five days later, it'll be a much more stable situation with a better view. Yeah, that's why I always taught the residents as well. You need to know how to set up the FACO machine because your scrub tech who's going to come there at midnight may not be the one who's able to set up the machine. And you have to be able to set up the FACO machine on your own if you, expect, you know, plan to take out the lens at the same time, like you said, a ruptured or violated lens capsule. Yeah, so, absolutely. Fortunately, most of the, um, you know, the, the, the trauma patients, they, they're young, you know, they have soft lenses, so, you know, you're not having to fake a hard cataracts, but yes, I think knowing how to set up the machine, the bimanual irrigation and aspiration is important. Oh, absolutely. And then again, you were saying earlier too, being thorough, not missing anything, checking the APD, make sure you're not missing an IOFB, intraocular foreign body, checking the other eye. 
<laughs> we see that mistake too. Only checking the trauma eye. That's obviously you got to check everything. Yeah, we we still have our residents dilate the other eye. Oh, uh, we sure. do too. You have to. Yeah. You gotta you gotta know everything that's going on before you get in that in that eye. Yeah, so absolutely. It, how do you talk to the patients about prognosis? That's one of, one of the things I found the toughest was that patients were just, especially the younger ones, will just fix it and yeah, not understand. How do you talk to patients about that? Um, yeah, the good, I, I think the patient conversation is critical. And then um, Farron Kuhn um, in the 80s, and based on the United States Eye Injury Registry, developed the ocular trauma score, which is quite complex, to actually, in terms of. So we're actually, in my other role is, is the um, president of American Society of Ophthalmic Trauma. We're trying to come up with an easier version that can be sort of generated um, without, uh, you know, manually sort of a, um electronic version. But in talking to the patients, actually, Dr. Um, Chris Rapawana was our keynote speaker at our trauma meeting last year and sort of you know, I think that pro- even though um, you may think the prognosis is good, I think painting painting a picture to the um, to the patient that's realistic and you know sometimes there are unanticipated things that happen after an open globe um, like like infection. So you know, painting painting a realistic um, picture, not overly optimistic. Um, um, sort of like you said, talking about the other eye and the importance of protecting that and not forgetting the other eye, I think are all critical in counseling patients um, with open globe injuries. Yeah, I think another uh, thing that I was amazed by, I, I did some research about the your assist, assistant chief of service position, which is, I went back and looked at many decades worth. The names that are on that list are like the preeminent figures in the history of ophthalmology. It's unbelievable. If anyone wants to check this out, it's on the, on the Wilmer website. You can find assistant chief of service. And this is basically, again, the benefit to your residents is they have this assistant chief of service, who's basically on call every day for the whole year, this person has finished a full residency and finished a fellowship, and now is coming back for an extra year just to focus on this. And that is amazing to have someone with that energy and and skill and obviously already trained to help you with that. UCLA doesn't have a program like that. But I think that model is really amazing. And then again, the the, the people who have done that, wow, such huge names. Yeah, I mean, it was a terrific experience, and I think every you know chief who's gone through them or has you know formally thought it was an, an incredible year. But I think we are one of the, I think we're the only probably program in the country where you have a fellowship trained person come back and spend a year. Now some programs do have a chief year right after right after like a uh, right after residency, so um, like a comp- before they apply to fellowship or if they're going to comprehensive, um, just before they go into practice. But um, but I do think it's nice to have someone fellowship trained because you have that extra. Experience Experience. So we are seeing a lot of complex cases. Um, so having extra training is um, and not being straight out of residency is important. But you know, as, a, as our trauma society is actually discussing, like, okay, at academic centers, who are the ones staffing sure. these open globe injuries? Because, like you said, it's residents repairing it, and you know, a lot of times it may be a fellow um, staffing, and you know, that could you know be a little bit less than ideal, especially you know with complex trauma. And so having experienced um, attendings, having people de- um, who are um, you know dedicated to not only just um, junior faculty or fellows, but having attendings who are really comfortable in trauma, um, um, I think is critical too. And it shouldn't be relegated to, again, the most junior, um, fa- only fellows, for example. Yeah, in fact, that's, that's usually the case, right? It's a, and it may not even be a fellow who's well-versed in ocular trauma. You were like the, you were like the, uh, on the other end of the, the spectrum. You had like a full Moorfields ocular trauma fellowship under your belt. So you're coming back as like a preeminent world expert of the trauma. That's amazing. Well, and they're also like, um, for example, the military actually has a lot of um, yeah. trauma courses. So like Walter Reed holds a trauma course every year. And I didn't take that before I was chief. But I think, you know, I think the courses and at an academy, there's a number of trauma courses that are held to go over the basics of, um, you know, suturing in, in the setting of trauma, um, as well as management of other um, ophthalmic emergencies. There's, um, so I think um, those are uh, great resources that um, those, for example, fellows who d- may not have a lot of trauma experience can use to, so that they can help them teach. Because not only do they have to, uh, you know, they have to teach it, which is, which is another yeah. uh, important skill. Yeah, in fact, uh, a lot of programs like here at UCLA, it was often this, the junior most, most ill-prepared uh, person who's sometimes attending this and these are the most complicated cases, the most difficult. Exactly. Exactly. So, this... so we th- we talked about like you know trauma fellowships in the future, and you know ways to encourage faculty to to be interested in trauma and, and take call, so that again it's not relegated to to just fellows. 
So do you then also get cases later that refer to you, let's say, patient had trauma years ago and now has a you know, dangling, dislocated crystalline lens for cataract surgery? Do you do a lot of those? I do, yes. Um, so that's uh, another passion of mine in terms of anterior segment reconstruction after trauma. Um, and the chiefs will often refer me, um, you know, the traumatic cataract after they do the initial repair, with, which I, you know, which I'll do with the residents. Well, that sounds like a those are stressful cases, though. <laughs> those are stressful. Yes, so absolutely. But, 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 you know, challenging, but fun to think about. And it's nice to be in an academic center where you have the armamentarium of, you know, retina surgeons, glaucoma, so we could, it's, you know, multidisciplinary. So I feel like at least, um, you know, having, a, you know, I'm not by myself. So again, you know, a lot of these cases may require VR. So it's, uh, it's in our setting, it's quite easy to, to, to do the combined cases. Oh yeah, for sure. Like an inter interocular foreign body in the vitreous to have a, your retina surgeon go back and take care of that, of course. To do exactly, it combined. Or the dislocated lens where, you know, um, you would want VR backup or, you know, VR to be involved as well. Are you mostly doing Yamane or do you like, like Gore-Tex fixation of lenses? What is your typical, if your patient has no support or, or you, honestly, even AC lenses have, in, in meta-analyses, have pretty good outcomes too. The ACI wells, yeah, I mean, it's funny, I just on Tuesday took out a, a, a ACI well, which was like stuck against the cornea, which was uh, uh, somebody referred to us. So I think ACI wells are fine in the in the right setting, and probably not in trauma, because there's a lot of, there's usually, you know, quite a lot of damage to the anterior sure. segment. Um, and, 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 a, and a badly placed ACI well is, is, is terrible. Um, <laughs> it is terrible. And, you know, I, I will say as a cornea surgeon, I'm biased against them just because they get in the way of our um, endothelial keratoplasties. But um, yeah, so my, yeah. I've I've been doing uh, Gore-Tex fixation with um, with the, the Invisa lens, um, so I think the Yamani is great. But I, I do do a lot of as a residency program director, I do do a lot of teaching, and I do feel that the Yamani there's just such uh, you know there's it's it's very hard to teach, um, and so I feel like with the Invisa you get more predictable results, and um, it's easier to teach um, and predictable sort of refractive outcomes as well. And the position of the lens is is not so subject to the to the sure. to tilt, yeah. Yeah, for, for those who may not be familiar, the Invista lens from Bausch is an acrylic single piece lens that has at the haptic optic junction like a little eyelet. So it's easy enough to thread something like an 8 Gore-Tex through there and really get great permanent long-term fixation. Yeah, we have Does a whole, uh, Go ahead. Oh, so I was going to say, residents often don't realize that th these were like actually like the Invista and then um, the Acreos, which is less ideal because it's a hydrophilic lens, but uh, they, they were actually designed for in the bag fixation, but it just because of the nice design with the, with the eyelets have been adapted for, um, you know, scleral fixation. Yeah, and it works really well. We have a lot of those videos of the Gore-Tex on Cataract Coach. And in fact, I, I've even changed my technique to something that uh, Dr. Jamin Brown from New York des de described, which was the... Intrascler the, the Gore-Tex is fully intrascleral. You can't yeah. see it under the conjunctiva. Amazing. And so that's especially in a younger person. You're not worried about it eroding through later because the knot's in the eye, and then the, the past of the Gore-Tex is actually within the sclera. So the con. You have to check out that video. Yeah, I'll send, I'll send you a link. It's, got, it's really neat. That's but awesome. I've also actually recently, now when I'm in practice, I actually stopped doing those cases and refer them to a former resident who's a vitreoretinal surgeon now who just does a complete vitrectomy. I think one of the catches with Yamane is a lot of the Yamane videos that I watch done by anterior segment surgeons, sometimes you see that haptic going way back in the mid vitreous and you almost certainly are putting traction on the vitreous, on the macula, chronic CME. Now studies have shown that the CME rate from Yamane is much higher than expected. And I think that may yeah. be part of it. Absolutely. And I, I, I agree with you, like whatever I'm doing scleral suture fixation, I'm doing it in a fully vitrectomized eye, because at that point, like you said, you're essentially unicameral. And like, you know, I think the risk of um, a retinal detachment is, is, is quite high. And so, you know, I've, I've had zero uh, retinal detachments after scleral suture fixation. And I think, again, it's because they're fully vitrectomized iris sutured. I think, you know, you can do your anterior vitrectomy, but when you're talking about a unicameral eye, you just don't want to, you know, take that chance of the patient having a, of having a detachment or, and as you said, I think with any scleral suture fixation, um, you know, there's high rates of CME. So I, I do extended steroids for, for all these patients. Um, but sure. as you said, the CME rates are, are, are high in, in, in all of these cases. I'll give you my other great pearl that I learned the hard way. When I refer the patient to the vitreoretinal surgeon for the full vitrectomy and then heals suture in the, the IOL, I'll tell them what lens power to put to ensure, <laughs> to, to ensure that the, because you can't always predict the effective lens position or even a little tilt. So I'll ensure the patient ends up myopic. So maybe post op they'll be like minus 125, minus one at 90. And then the patient comes back to me three months later, I do their LASIK or PRK, 
and the patients are blown away. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, I, I do. I, I feel like sometimes retina surgeons ask me to do it just so you can do the IOL calculation. So that's that's hilarious. Yeah, I always send the patients and I always say, put in this power lens. And I know the patient's <laughs> going to end up just a little more. Because obviously with, the, with LASIK, I'd much rather do a clean myopic ablation than any kind of hyperopic ablation. Yeah, absolutely. It's so that's much, it, so much cleaner. That's a great pearl. You know, the last thing I want to talk about is that Applying to residency program, this is a different game now. So one of the things that surprised me is, like I said, I'm an older guy. I finished residency in 2000, and I applied to 15 programs, interviewed at 13, and got my number one. But now I, it's routine. I hear people saying they're applying to like 70, 80, 90, 100 programs. Is this really true? Is this where we're at? Yeah, the average number is 70. So as you mentioned, the number of applications are, um, the number of programs students are applying to have skyrocketed. So we can see this actually not only in ophthalmology and every subspecialty. Now, many program directors, including ophthalmology, have advocated for an application cap. I don't think we're going to see it in our lifetime for reasons such as, you know, um, re sort of restricting applicant uh, free choice. But I think what we did, so ophthalmology is actually the first specialty to have implemented an interview cap, which I think is great. So we're the only subspecialty in medicine to do that. And What's so the cap? actually, the cap is this year it was 15. So when okay. we first implemented it, it was higher. Um, and I think it was 18, then it went to, um, and so this year it was 15. And um, other specialties in medicine are actually asking it, like the AAMC has contacted us because they want to know how we did it. And, you know, I think 15 is great because the thing about the, the problem with the application cap is you just don't know how competitive an applicant is. You can try to approximate and give them some guidance. But now for the interview, if they get, you know, more than 15 interviews, by definition, this is a competitive applicant. So limiting them to 15, you, it's hard yeah. to, um, to, to sort of argue that that's going to disadvantage that applicant, whereas an application cap might. So I love the 15 interview cap. I think it reduces interview hoarding. Um, and so it benefits, I think it benefits everyone. Uh, because people would often accept more interviews and then cancel at the last minute, and then your other programs are scrambling mm -hmm. to take people off their wait list, so that's not fair to the program or to the um, people going off the wait list. So I love the 15 interview cap. I don't think it's we yeah the, the average you need to map in op, in ophthalmology is about is about 13, so it's a little more generous. But I think 15 is a nice um, generous cap that everyone's comfortable with. Also, if you interview, let's say only let's say six or seven, you have a lower odds of matching then. Definitely, exactly. So the, the the number is actually twelve. Is what is the is the average number of interviews needed to match an ophthalmology? So again, at fifteen, you can be confident that your students going to match for the most part. Yeah, I think I got lucky. I applied to ophthalmology at the nadir, at the low point, with like the fewest number of applications. Now we're like at the zenith, with the most number of applications, like the most competitive ever. If I was if I was applying to ophthalmology today, I'd be doing family practice. Yeah. I don't think I'd get it. it just, and then. <laughs> and then the, the, I think the reason we started the interview cap in the era of COVID is because in the era of virtual interviewing, you can imagine an applicant, there used to be kind of a self cap because you can't travel to like, more, you'd imagine arranging travel flights to more than 15 programs. Yeah. But now with the virtual, the reason SF Match decided to do that interview cap was really, they were worried that with the virtual, it would really lead to people interviewing at 30, 30 or something programs. So that's why um, they instituted it. It's been successful, as as we know, because they've actually decreased the cap. So that just shows it's not adversely affecting um, applicants. And you know, we've done surveys, and applicants and program directors think it's think it's a good thing. Are we still going to stick with you know the virtual interviews, the online ones? Or are we going to go back to in person? I kind of miss the in person ones. Good question, Uday. So SF Match actually um, just shared results. So most applicants actually, the applicants want virtual interviews and then the program directors, the majority want in person. So this is the thing, this is my take. And we actually just wrote an editorial for ac academic medicine on this. We can't go back to the all in person because imagine the cost for applicants, right? Like these yeah. are medical students, they're living on loans, like 15 is going to cost them an enormous amount. So I do think that we have to come up with something that's more equitable. And I know, you know, we do, we all miss the live in-person interviews, but just the cost for, for, for students who are not, it, they really depend on their families, I think, to, to cover the cost of the interview. So the, the equity issue there is, is um, at the forefront. So ophthalmology was actually the first specialty again to do this um, virtual, the in-person open house, which about half of the programs did. So tell me about the, the open house, because this is something new in the last couple year or two that, most people don't know about. 
Exactly. So this was the last two years that ophthalmology and again, medicines looking at other specialties are looking at us as the model because they they also are interested in this. So what they did was the um, after ophthalmology program directors submit their rank list, there's a period of approximately two weeks where applicants can go and visit programs in person. And that's before they submit their rank list. So but really after the program is already locked in. That's right. So it only it's a it's an advantage for the applicant so they can come ask any questions, feel at ease. And if they don't go, it's not going to penalize them because that's the thing with the virtual. We can't have like an option for both in person and virtual interviews, because if someone shows up in person, we're going to think they're just more yeah. they're more interested. So that's the whole equity issue. So I think whatever actually for fellowship programs, they some they made it optional. So they said you can either do in person or um um, virtual and some chose in person and some virtual, but I think it actually disadvantaged the programs that chose virtual because other, you know, that when applicants, they would come, you know, if, if when it was in person, so they would get to know more about the program. So I think whatever we do, it has to be number one, uniform. And I sure. think for fellowships, it be, it should be uniform so that you're not disadvantaged disadvantaging programs or applicants. And then for residencies, I mean, for residencies, it will always be uniform just because SF match has, you know, governs everything. And, you know, and even across medicine, like it was virtual for all um, medicines, re uh, all residencies outside ophthalmology. But I think uniformity is important. We have to look at equity um, for applicants in terms of the cost, but there has to be some in-person component, but I just think it's going to take some more. I, I just don't see us going back to the way it was, which is all in person, unfortunately. Yeah, because if you think about it, I mean, to fly somewhere now, airfare's gotten so expensive. Can you imagine with this, the new, the, these new prices? Like, it would literally be uh, prohibitive for 15, um, you know, for 15 interviews. Yeah, it'd be like at least $1,000 per interview. That could be yeah. like $20,000 to interview 15 programs. And the amount of just airport wear and tear. I mean, we all hate going to the airport. <laughs> Exactly. So with the open houses, it turns out about 54% of ophthalmology programs had open houses and about 35% of applicants attended them. And 50% of those who attended said their um, list was altered by the um, oh, wow. by, by attending. So, it's, so in those know, two weeks, how many programs do med students go to that our applicants go to? So it's house. much less than the 15. So it's on average, it, I think it was about, you know, three to four at most. So much, much more manageable. But again, you know, there, I feel some, there were some drawbacks to it because for example, so you can't really plan for it as a program because you're not allowed to ask like how many, like if you're coming until after you submit your rank mm. list. So then some programs plan for a lot more than what, who, than who ended up coming. So I think there's still some things to work out, but again, personally, I just don't see us going into the, you know, back to the all in person. So we have to continue to try to, you know, see, be innovative and come up with best practices for making it more fair, but also, uh, you know, maximizing the, in-person aspect for both programs and applicants. As an applicant, how do you stand out? How do you make a great impression in a Zoom interview? I don't know what the answer is. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, the, the, the virtual interview, um, I think a lot of med schools too are sort of advising students, for example, think simple things like, you know, the background, um, you know, having a you know plain and simple background and then uh, practicing with them for virtual interviews because it's definitely, it definitely can disadvantage, um, for example, I mean, I, I guess in-person interviews can, but like, you know, for the more introverted applicants and so forth. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of program directors don't like the virtual because it's hard to, 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 to you know, to really get the um, to get an idea of the applicant. So again, we have to sort of think about like best practices for virtual interviewing um, and having, you know, preparation for the students and then um, for the programs. I think, you know, I think a lot of positive things came about it though. So a lot of programs did update their information, their websites, things about, you know, we've been advocating for a program, um, uh, sort of transparency of programs in terms of what your program offers. So I think um, that improved. And so I think there were definitely a lot of positives and innovations with this that we need to keep, to keep striving to improve. Is there any talk about increasing number of residency spots? I think we're, the U.S. is somewhere around what, 450, 460 or something? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there there has been talk about it. I know some, you know, some programs, if you can, sh you know, justify your the surgical volume and the training, you know, you can get a compliment increase at Wilmer. You know, we started with eight residents back, um, you know, over 15 years ago, we had eight residents and we slowly now we have five. Uh, I always tell our chair we're not going below five. But I do think uh, I think I heard, um, you know, so I think if you have the um, surgical and um, and medical um, experience for the residents, then compliment increases 
increases and in, in increasing the number of spots that we're training, I think is good because we see the number of applicants is increasing and the number of spots are staying the same. So, um, you know, our match, our match rate is, is affected by that. And also, you know, the uh, so, sort of uh, lots of disparities in ophthalmology, so geographic disparity. So in terms of, um, you know, mo most of the surgeons are, are located in urban areas. So I think as we think of our workforce um, and access, mm -hmm. I think sort of training surgeons to be in rural areas, I think will be critical. Yeah, I always thought like UCLA with eight residents could definitely expand to nine or ten. And just, there's certainly enough volume. LA is an unusual city because LA is such a mega city with two residencies, two med schools. Compared That's to like amazing. Chicago, which is smaller than LA, has, I don't know, like eight, seven, eight, nine, like a huge number. Or even, know, even Boston has more than LA. And Boston's yeah. tiny. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah, I, I think there are a lot of good changes coming. Now, as, a, as an applicant, how do you stand out in your application because now there's no more the old stuff that we used to, that programs used to do and UCLA used to do this as well was USMLE step one cutoff level and so now there's no you more no more USMLE step one score there's no more grades in most med schools and in fact a lot of schools like UCLA there's no no more AOA that's gone too alpha yeah. omega alpha so how do you yep. stand out yeah, I think with Alpha Mega, Alpha Mega Alpha, they found there's some biases that so they're, you know, uh, reevaluating uh, how to fair, uh, fairly pick students to be, uh, to have equal representation in AOA. But yeah, how to stand out, that's a great question. So I think uh, things have changed in terms of the application screening process. And as you mentioned, Uday, I mean, at Hopkins, we did have a cutoff, an informal cutoff too. So I think we realized that, you know, the step one score is not necessarily correlated with a good ophthalmology resident. But I will say um, in terms of standing out, because because of that pass fail, um, most med schools going to pass fail during COVID, and like you said, the lack of a score. I think a couple of things became more important. So I think letters of recommendation um, became more important. I think the importance of mentors is critical. Many of us went into ophthalmology because of mentors and the support of their mentors. Mm. So I think there's you can't underestimate you know finding uh, mentors who will support you both within your institution and outside. And luckily, through you know many programs, like for example, the American Academy of Ophthalmology has a mentoring program. The minority ophthalmology mentoring program and other programs there's lots of summer programs that institutions have so there's lots of ways to get mentors outside your institution for example if you're at a small institution where there's no ophthalmology department so that's important and then um, you know, the personal statements, so SF Match got rid of the traditional personal statement and they replaced it with questions like, you know, name a, t you know, uh, name a time where you uh, faced, um, uh, name a time where you demonstrated resilience and so, sure. sort of getting at sort of distance traveled um, questions more and, you know, that that's um, really important and it really helped us, again, the personal statement, I feel like this sort of, it's just much more focused and it's, it's much more helpful than just a free for all statement where, it, you know, an applicant describes why you know they went into ophthalmology because their family member you know had had vision loss so this is more again about what the applicant has overcome to get where they are so i think that's important now one caveat is what we didn't want to happen was step two replace step one but you know right. unfortunately i do think that's uh, so this year so i advise my hopkins students i'm like you know take step two if you're you know a good test taker but otherwise you know you can wait but then some programs they wanted to see they did uh, want they were uncomfortable with no objective metrics in so they actually did want to see it. So I think we're going to have to see how that plays out. But now, you know, I do tell the students that, you know, do take the step, you know, to take it before your application, because I know some program directors just told mm -hmm. me that, you know, what's their step two score? We, we don't, you know, we want to see it. So. Yeah, I think one of the most important things you said was a mentor. The role of the mentor cannot be emphasized enough. And you'll never guess back in the 19, mid 1990s at USC, who was my mentor? Whose lab did I work in? Peter McDonald. Oh, <laughs> that's amazing, I, I, yeah, Peter. I, I was his med student, and I'm sure he thought I was dumber than a bucket of rocks. But that's <laughs> <laughs> no. amazing, yeah. But I did Peter. somehow I did when we had these rabbits that we would do uh, PRK on and see which drug slowed epithelial closure, right? Because we had one of these first eczema lasers at USC, and so in the vivarium, the rabbits got Q six hour drops. So I remember the fellow put the drops in at 12 noon and 6 p.m., and I volunteer, volunteered to put the drops in at midnight and 6 a.m. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> but yeah, uh, he, he, he was awesome. He had just a great sense of humor. But you're right, you know, that mentorship made all the difference. Going to, to USC for med school, even though I did UCLA for residency, I came across town, they were the best people. They were, 
in fact, Hopkins people, Wilmer people, who started USC's Doheny Institute at the time. Yeah. Yeah. The chair at the time was Stephen Ryan. The vice chair was was um, was um, um, uh, Smith, Ron Smith. Amazing people. John Irvine was my mentor too, and. Yeah, these we, are used they, we used to call it Wilbur West, actually. So when I was a med student, USC was something where a, a program we all applied to, and you yeah. know, many of us went to. So yeah, yeah, it's um, changed a bit over the years. All these programs have obviously keep evolving, keep changing. But yeah, getting that mentor thing is so important. I recently was talking with a couple of med students. Multiple med students actually emailed me through Cataract Coach after the match because they didn't match at all, and they were just wanted to seek my advice. And I, I talked to all of them. I talked to all of them to see what advice I could possibly give them, but sometimes it's hard to stand out in the letters of rec because, you know, you and I have read thousands of applications. That's like not an understatement, thousands, over the, certainly over the many years. And all the letters tend to sound pretty similar after a while. No one submits a letter that's not amazing. So yeah. the only thing I could think of to stand out was I, I, I told the, these young applicants, you got to find someone who's going to go to bat for you. Yep. I think that's critical. Good mentorship. First of all, they advise you kind of, so at, you know, at Hopkins, we tell the med students like meet with myself and our med student educator, who's Dr. Henry Jampel kind of before, during, after. So in, in addition to their mentors, um, and like you said, the mentor is just critical at every step for the, from the decision to apply to ophthalmology to, you know, whether they pursue a fellowship to even faculty, like you said, mentorship is key. Um, yeah. So how, how on your end, because I still remember going through applications, even like as late as last year or the year before, where you were given hundreds of applications to read. And the amount of time it takes, and I, I'm so concerned with giving everyone a fair shake that I spent like time reading every single application, every answer, every letter. But after a while, boy, I mean, I had just dozens of pages of notes. I looked like a mad professor. <laughs> How do you make sense of it all when you get your program? I'm sure Wilmer got more than 500 applications. Um, yes. Well, we had a 470 this year. Okay, yes, pretty close. It's, yeah, it's, it's steadily increased each year. But yeah, that I'll tell you, this is my least far, favorite part about being PD, the, the selection process. But uh, one thing we did over the last few years is number one, like you said, we got rid of the cutoff of, you know, and then the, the USMLE cutoff and sort of these, you know, arbitrary metrics. So we, we do review um, pretty much all applications. So we had to expand the committee. The other thing mm. we do is we have each application reviewed by two different faculty. So I know it's more work but you know you can imagine one faculty member like let's say you're tired and you're just going through it quickly sure. and then you know so now that each one gets two reviews and then I'll, and then I could be the final judge so like for example if two faculty say yes I don't have to spend that much time um, reviewing the application but you know if one says yes and one says no then I'll then I'll spend some time um, so I think the whole the whole and actually the AUPO had a whole uh, session on holistic screening and like different rubrics that you can use to make the process more fair because unfortunately there's just a lot of biases that what, what are some it. of the rubrics or what are some of the, the, the ways of doing it just kind of in general. Right. So, you know, just going beyond the, um, so they have like experience attributes and metrics models. So again, going back to so what we used to do, which is AOA, yes, no, sure. you know, use, use simile step one score and sort of looking at, um, you know, the distance traveled. There's, you know, actually some, some programs have a distance travel score now. Um, I mean, and I mean that, di distance traveled mean like your experience in life, like what's your life? Exactly. Okay, yep. gotcha, How, gotcha. What you had to do to get to where you are. Cause you know, some people had, you know, to face a number of barriers to, to get where they are. So looking, looking at that and, 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 and crediting the applicant to with, with the background, like first generation uh, college graduates, for example, or having to support yourself working through college or medical school. I think that's all very important. One thing we're seeing today when we look at double AMC data is that, you know, medicine is becoming a more elite subspecialty. So we have actually made strides with women. Now there's more women in medical school, racial and ethnic diversity is better, but the socioeconomic diversity is actually worse. So more oh, and more, wow. they're coming from the top, you know, quintile of, um, you know, they're basically coming from families with um, quintile, you know, the top two quintiles of um, income. So, um, and you can see it's, it's, it's that it's getting worse over the years. So I really think we have to pay attention to some of the metrics, like again, first generation college graduates who may, may not have all the resources that um, someone who's uh, both parents are physicians have and so forth. Um, so, so looking at that and, um, you know, other, other things like service, um, leadership and, and just giving value to other less traditionally, uh, valued, uh, 
like resilience, for example, I think is important. And also ophthalmology, this, they were also, we were the, I think the only specialty to uniformly um, use situational judgment testing. Um, so I don't, it, no, tell me, I don't know about that. Tell me. Yeah, so basically, this is something that's been used in undergraduate medical education, where students are given different scenarios, and they um, they have to you know answer how they would respond. And there also there's also some recorded um, inter um, recorded questions that we can actually see the student answering questions. Um, that it's um, we use the company. Um, um, it's Alta Suite or Casper. So again, it was new for us as program directors, and I didn't have any experience with it before. Um, in terms of under some some of the students had actually used it when they applied to medical school, the situational judgment testing. But um, it's just another sort of less, um, you know, it's another metric that sort of um, as, uh, assesses how students respond in sort of stressful situations and um, teamwork and things like that. So they ask different questions. So that we use that and. And actually, a AUPO is analyzing, you know, how that affected, um, how that affected our screening process. But just thinking about more ways that we can use holistic screening, but um, um, to to improve our selection process, which is very imperfect and biased, and we all know that and random. Yeah, so I actually just wrote that down. I want to, I'm gonna look this up. Situational yeah. judgment. Situational testing. judgment C testing. Casper, exactly. huh? I'll look it up. Yep, exactly. It's, I'm, so. I, I'm, it's, I'm like a blank slate. Here. I don't know anything about it. Yeah, but it's 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 interesting. Yeah, because it just, it begs the question when you say it's that slanted, so it just kind of almost doesn't give hope to people who are who are a different part of the economic spectrum of even ever being a physician. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, a lot of our programs, like we've our our diversity programs, we've expanded to include, for example, first generation, um, you know, college graduate um, and or socioeconomically disadvantaged, with that, which I think is important for um, for DEI programs to include as well. Yeah, wow, that's all great advice. So we'll, we'll see what happens with the next match. But I also think that there's a reason why you can't, you, they, they don't want to limit the number of applications. The SF match people are getting paid per application. <laughs> and it ain't yeah. that, it's not that much more, more work. They're getting a lot. In fact, I think there are only two specialties left at SF match, right? Urology and ophthalmology, only two. That's right. Actually, yeah, we just had um, we just had a publication on like the lack of the couples match with because there's a lot of medical yeah. more and more medical students are also becoming couples. So, you know, it's it's a disadvantage that we're not sort of uh, able to offer them a couples match. So, yes, they, you're right. There are only two specialties left. Um, I do think oh, one other innovation I we didn't discuss today, which is I think is important that we're seeing in um, ENT and many, um, I think, 17 other specialties is um, signaling, preference signaling. Have you have you heard no, of that? Oh, I'm writing this down too. Tell right. me again. So, Signaling. This is signaling, yeah. So this is something I know many ophthalmology programs are interested in. So basically, the students get a certain number of tokens or signals where they can express their interest in a program. Oh. So right now, you know, there's all these backdoor conversations, like, you know, you'll get emails from chairs, other program directors about a student's interest, uh, the student themselves about their interest in a program, which is, it's really, uh, it's a, there's a little bit of unfairness to it, right? Because some for students sure. may have, yeah, but now with preference signaling, the, for example, the number of signals varies per specialty, but for example, in ENT, they may give, they may have the ability to, to give five signals to their programs they're interested mm. in. So that, for example, since we don't have a couples match, that that could be very helpful. And um, you know, there's been positive, um, there's been positive sort of fee feedback from both programs and um, applicants on preference signaling. So we may see that in ophthalmology in the future. But I think it's a way to sort of limit, like you said, this to deal with this application, um, the exp the application inflation problem. Um, but in a sort of systematic, fair way. And what's the optimal number of signals? We don't know. And mm. I think we should be generous with the signals so that, you know, the students. But I do think it's nice to have, um, that's, again, a, a more uniform way of signaling interest that's more fair than all these kind of backdoor conversations that currently happen. And it could help applicants with, again, with like geographic constrictions, like a, like a significant other, um, uh, which they, you know, can't couples match with. And now it's four years where they'll be separated. So it's really important. Yeah, that's so interesting, too, because the way the match process works, ideally, the applicant ranks the programs that she or he likes best in order. The programs rank the applicants that they like best in the order. And it shouldn't matter, does the resident want to come, does, does the applicant want to come to our residency program? But, I know. But, yeah. but it, the programs are so concerned with, like, we don't want to go too far down our rank list. Why? Yeah. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't get it. I know. I know, like you said, no one. It's more like a pride thing, right? I think it's like an ego thing that you know you, you matched in your top. What, what, like you said, it shouldn't matter. And I think many program directors do try to 
not consider what, you know, what you said, we try to say that, you know, look, we're not going to try to figure out if they're going to come here. We're going to rank them based on you right. know, qualifications and nothing else. But um, yeah, but the signaling again, at least in it can, in terms of reviewing 470 applications, it can maybe help if let's say you come down to two and you know, they're, e they look equal on paper, but then you have a signal for one, it may help. And then again, a fair way for applicants to sort of express interest in a program. Well, that'd be a, you'd, you'd be able to use your signal token before the interview or is after the interview? Yeah, no, it's to get the interview. It's before. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. But you're right. You, you're right, though. Signal, they, they did think about signals at different stages, but the way ENT and them used it now was for the for the initial interview. So that's, again, to dealing with this whole, you know, dealing with the unprecedented number of applications. So this, this will help program directors. Kind of narrowed that down. Yeah, there's also a, a geographic bias. So I talked to a med student who was from New York general area, tri-state area, Went to undergrad there, med school there, everything there. And he says he only got interviews at programs in New York and New Jersey. He got no programs, no interviews at programs in any other state. And he says he's willing to travel anywhere. Mm -hmm. Exactly. This is what the prep student would help. And imagine like if he asked his mentor to email every single program and everyone did that, right? We would be inundated. Yeah. So this is why I think the preference signaling is a nice, neat way to, nice, everyone gets the same number of signals and, you know. Uh, but I just think it has to be generous enough so that, you know, students don't, you know, spend a lot of time worrying about like, you know, so we, it could be like 10 signals, for example, which would not be 10 out of their 70, you know? And that's not bad. Yeah, I think that. Well, because you said that you, the number of programs needed to interview is kind of a dozen-ish. Yeah. So you want, you want to make sure at least some of those dozen are like in the geographic areas or the programs you like or like you're going to couples match or... Or exactly. Yeah, no, and it does take counseling because you don't want them to signal only top programs because like you said, the student would shoot themselves in their foot. So you want to have them signal sort of a, you know, a, a wide variety of tiers like top tier, middle tier, you know, and so forth. There's one more secret too for ophthalmology residency that people may not know that it's the horse, not the track that wins the race and a good horse can race on any track. And as much as I loved my UCLA residency program, which is where I went, it actually doesn't matter where you do residency. It just doesn't. <laughs> it just really doesn't. That's a, that's a great point, isn't it? Right? So it's what you get out of it. Anyway, I want to thank you. What an incredible interview. I really enjoyed talking to you. I learned so much about residency programs, this whole application process, which is new to so many people. And we have a lot of med students who listen to this podcast. You'll be surprised. And then my favorite of all is the ocular trauma. And if you have, if your re residents have good uh, video of ocular trauma cases, please send them over for Cataract Coach. I'll edit them even. I'll do the voiceover. But we're always looking for good video. That sounds great today. You've really touched a lot of vet students and residents through your podcast and your cataract coach. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. And it's been a pleasure. All right. Take care. Good night. Thanks for enjoying that podcast with me. I trust that you learned a lot about ophthalmology residency and even how to deal with certain types of ocular trauma. Next time, we're going to have another great podcast coming up with a mentor of mine who's going to give us some very valuable lessons that I guarantee you will shape the future of your career. These are pearls that I learned from him many years ago and have turned out to be incredible. Remember, too, our podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Google, wherever you find your podcasts. You can download them so you can listen as you exercise or drive to work. I think you'll enjoy it that way as well. And remember, starting next month in June, we're going to do a new podcast every single week. It's going to be some great learning. Stay tuned.